So in this lecture, I'd just like to give a few examples of why we care. I've already mentioned in um, in previous lectures about how uh, transformation of coordinates are, are needed, but we'll just talk about it a little bit more uh, explicitly here before we continue to then talk about some other transformation properties and then uh, use symmetries to simplify uh, tensors. So let's use our connectivity example. J's current density, which is, you know, charge per unit area per unit time and E, which actually we'll write as script E. This electric field, which is, I'll just write that electric field. This is current density. This is electric field, which is like volts per meter or centimeters, volts per centimeter, you know, whatever the unit length is. And now we can write with all of our background. It's a very useful expression. where this tensor is the electrical conductivity. So why the heck, you know, we always look at J equals sigma E or it's a, a even more simplified uh, counterpart where we take the uh, specific where, where we, this is actually uh, without uh, using uh, any particular area or volume because it's got unit area in here and it's got uh, distance here. We can remove that and look at, you know, this is equivalent to Ohm's law, which equals V equals, you know, IR, <clears throat> except that we have uh, uh, um, added dimensions to this in order to make it not depend on the length or area, and that's why J equals sigma E is actually the more universal form of uh, Ohm's law. Again, implying uh, linear relationships between electric field and current. So um, if I have a sample, and I've mentioned this in words, but I'm just gonna make it more explicit here now. Imagine that I have just some sample. And for whatever reason, whatever experimental reason, I always have this thing cut out in some way with a, a normal that is in some strange HKL. Or maybe not so strange. Maybe it's 111, you know, whatever it is. Well, I take that block of material. And this is actually what I have in the lab. And, you know, I'm measuring, let's say, current coming out of here after I've applied an electric field in this direction. Now we're going to talk about this exact uh, case later. We're going to come back to it because it's a very, very useful one where you say, you know, actually I'm, I'm applying. And, and it's even more important to think about tensors when j is not along to e because yes these could be, you know they're they're shifted with respect to the cartesian system which means that the transformation of axes is important but there's another factor which is if j is not parallel to e all the time then it means that um, you actually have to do some other things in addition to just transforming axes to understand what the conductivity is when you're coming out of here so that's an example of 
you know, how you can use this. And uh, we would change coordinate systems to our experimental one, and that would have, you know, maybe I like to call this x in my experiment, and I have, you know, y here and z here, let's say. And so clearly I'd have to transform particular properties that I know about with respect to the cube axes, which is if, let's say, it's a cubic material and I'm using these cubic axes. So let's think about our about that in terms of our quantities here now a little more carefully. And it may be a little obvious, but I just want to make sure that it's very clear that if I transform the axes here, you know, we go from x1, I should have put x1 prime here, x2 prime, x3 prime, right? So I go from x2 x3, I'm going to well, my ji are certainly going to change. We know that because J is a displacement, remember? And so remember how we showed that uh, if I change coordinate systems, uh, you know, J gets transformed. And the same would be for the input, which is the uh, electric field. I should put. So we know that that vector, by changing coordinate systems, it can be transformed into the new coordinate system. So basically what that means is that the, you know, I put in uh, electric field, I measure current. So the thing I'm actually after is connectivity. That's the thing that's telling me about the material, right? And, you know, the thing that's telling me about the material is normally referenced in the X1, X2, X3 system. So what this tells me is that if I have a new Ji and a new Ei, then of course that's going to create a new uh, sigma Ij. Now does that mean that I really need to go through each one of these steps every time in order to get that? And the answer is no. Of course we're gonna we're gonna uh, do some transformations that are going to help us just go directly from here to here. And um, you see now why that's kind of useful, is if this is my experimental setup and I put this in and I measure this, uh, it'd be nice to be able to say, all right, I can determine uh, my conductivity uh, directly from that and relate it to anything I need to do in the old system with respect to the um, x1, x2, and, and x3. So, for example, the, the band gaps uh, may be um, determined in x, y, and z directions in the cubic system. And so I'm measuring conductivity here, but I'd like to relate that back to the band structure in the original one. So I can just measure, measure, get this stuff, and immediately understand how it's related to the to the typical conductivities measured in the in the cubic system. And it'd be nice to be able to transform this directly and not have to deal with J and E uh, at all. And that's what we're going to do. Now, just one more before we end this lecture. This is kind of talking about a very practical conductivity case. Uh, but let's look at another a uh, little bit more esoteric, but actually real case as well, dealing with electronic materials, but being, be dealing with mechanical properties, interestingly enough. So let's uh, erase our screen and go to that example. So another example is something I encountered when I was doing work on looking at misfit dislocation relaxation in mismatch films. So if you look at semiconductor films that today we're able to engineer and Strain silicon is in your 
a lot of chips in your laptop. But all that work started with things like what we're talking about here, which I'm drawing here. So there's a substrate, and it has one lattice constant in the crystal. You know, let's say it's got a lattice constant like this. I'm looking at a cube on the side of one of the unit cells in there. And actually, the um, let's imagine the intrinsic, the intrinsic lattice of this material wants to be bigger. But because it's a thin film, it was deposited layer by layer. You actually force the atoms to go on where. And so it gets tetragonally distorted. So if you think about it from a crystal point of view, you're actually um, uh, making it orthorhombic uh, instead of um, uh, cubic. Now it could be tetragonal, except as soon as these defects come in, relaxation in the two different directions are not the same. So actually um, the lattice constants can be different in the two in plane directions as well. But if it's fully strained, it's uh, tetragonal. So, um, and we'll look at the, the fully strained case uh, first. Uh, so if I look at this strained film, and typically this direction, it's the 001 direction. And that's usually then assigned X3, right? So if I look... Um, and that's very convenient, by the way, because, you know, when X3 is assigned there, all the elastic constants are in the form. You're, you're all set. Uh, uh, but here's the problem. If I look at the these faces I've drawn here, you know, this is actually the 100 direction. Then going out this direction is the, and this one here I've drawn is the 110 then. And this direction is a 1, one bar O. Right. So, uh, so it's a cubic system, and, and the the um, elastic constants the elastic constants are known in the 100 coordinate system, and. Yeah, let's keep it this way, actually. So uh, in this system with the tetragonal strain, we have I'm putting in quotes because it's the same uh, in a uh, cubic system with uh, the strain I'm talking about is the if it's fully strained, it's biaxial. So this is biaxial strained case because this thing's being forced to sit on the same lattice constant. It's being pushed up because it's a larger lattice constant and a smaller one. And uh, so you say, okay, fine, you know, what's the problem? And the problem is that when defects come in, defects lie at this interface along the 110 directions at the interface as I'm drawing them here. So if you look here, this is dislocation, dislocation, dislocation. Now, for those of you aficionados that love dislocations, uh, we have a problem because if I look down at dislocation, their um, stress fields right, are defined in this way. with Z coming out because straight line and uh, for a screw dislocation 
you have sigma 1, 3 equals g dot b over 2 pi y over x squared plus y squared. So this is screw dislocation. And you have sigma 2, 3 equals. Now, uh, it turns out the edge dislocations, same reference system, so still coming out with x and y divine, defined that way, are even more complicated. Uh, we will define an elastic constant d, which is the shear modulus times b over 2 pi 1 minus nu, so I don't have to keep on writing that. And um, that's a 3, 3x squared. So I'm not going to write down the rest of them, but we have different expressions for sigma 2, 2, sigma 1, 2, sigma 3, 3 is related by sigma uh, 1, and same up here, by the way, c 3, 3 is related to c 1 and c 2, so there's not a unique lot of, there's not a unique uh, constant there. Um, and, and so when you look at this, you say, well, what's the problem? The problem is that the elastic constants, things I have there and there and there are all defined uh, in uh, the uh, they all come from actually the CIJ right so this you know Hooke's law stress in our simplified case here. So, you know, strain and stress are related by the CIJ. Remember, this is not a unique one. And actually, in the biaxial case, if I remember, I think, I think C uh, equals minus C1, 2 over C1, one, I believe, if I remember correctly. So it just goes, you know, there's only two uh, elastic constants to actually worry about the um, C12 and the C11. So anyway, um, the what you'd like to do is to understand and map stress and strain for this case where I have the lattice mismatch and I have the defects coming out. And I'd like to come in and map... Uh, the stress and strain as a function of film thickness, for example, around the uh, any kind of localized point that I want. So, um, the stress fields of the dislocations have to be superimposed on top of the strain case for the uh, biaxial stress. The, la the elastic constants, that wouldn't be so bad, except the elastic constants are on the cubic system. So, um, but the stress and the strain that we want to relate to are also in the cubic system. So uh, what you really want to do then is um, transform uh, things back and forth between the, um, uh, the two systems. So it's very difficult to, uh, to deal with. And uh, the only solution is really to transform the axes for uh, different things as you go back and forth, summing uh, different components. So the elastic constants being in the cubic system and having the dislocations run with their equation and their xy in a different system rotated by 45 degrees, because you see it's rotated by 45 degrees in plane. It's a pretty simple transformation. Um, and best handled by 
just putting it into MATLAB, which is how we did it. But just another example. So hopefully with these examples, you can see the importance of how uh, you need to um, transform between you know, one crystal system and another reference frame sometimes.